these are people that all the years they've been waiting for the Messiah. But the Messiah was right there, but they cannot see. Why? They become blind because of their selfish ambition. Imagine you're walking on the road and somebody call your name, Obed. You look, you don't know that person. What happened? You keep going. I look at it as nothing. I'm pressing for something more important. This Palm Sunday, think about that. There's something important. Him and him crucified. The relationship with him. Because the day you die, your mansion will not go with you. Your degree will not go with you. We're just going to write it in your tomb. We're singing songs in the church. We're shouting. We're praising God. But the question is that if it gets complicated, can you still stand and glorify him? Or you reject him? I am CTNC. I am CTNC. I am CTNC. I am CTNC. And I am CTNC. 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 Amen. Father, we bless your holy name. For stirring the heart of your children about prayer in this season that we are in. We pray, Lord, that uh, even if we leave this place today, every one of us will take this at home and in our workplace and continue to pray. Father, we pray for the heart of man to be transformed. That's what it will take. It take the heart to be touched, and you alone can do it. We commit uh, our time of teaching into your hand that you will be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. God is good. I want to wish you all a happy Palm Sunday. Amen. Last time I started a teaching that I tired of frequently ask question about baptism and talking about the baptism of uh, of water, the baptism of uh, Holy Spirit, and the baptism of the of uh, fire. So I start answering those questions. But I, as I was praying, I was like, okay, it's Palm Sunday. I can't just go in answering questions without making a, some observation about the meaning of this. Hallelujah. It's very, very meaningful. So I'm going to make some observation, and then I'm going to go back to time with Lord to what I was working on last time. Amen. Matthew chapter 21, uh, 1 to 18. That's the text uh, that I will use to make these observations. Uh, it's very, very important for us to, um, to, to understand the meaning of, of, of the, the, this, uh, this particular event here, which takes place right before the week that we call the Holy Week. Amen. Uh, next week will be the time where we will have even a revival here that we call at the cross that will start on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we hope you will not only come, but you will also invite somebody to be part of it. Amen? Hallelujah. So we will talk about, uh, next we will talk about uh, uh, Jesus Christ dying on the cross, why he died for us. And we will talk about uh, uh, he was buried, why and uh, we will talk about his resurrection. Amen. And we will talk about all the benefit that we get for the cross. Without the cross, Christianity is nothing. Without resurrection, Christianity is just another religion. Amen. But we are not just another religion. 
Hallelujah. So that's what we're going to talk about. But this before that week, something very, very important took place. Amen. Uh, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, God gave a prophecy through the, uh, the servant of the Lord to tell Israel that there will be a time where someone, the king, amen, will come riding on a donkey and a cart, and that will be an indication of who the Messiah is. Amen. As I was reading that, and I got to verse 11, the question was asked, who's this guy? And the answer was, a prophet from Nazareth by Galilee. I'm like, wow. They still did not get it. Hallelujah. They still did not get it. Even his own disciple, it took them a while to understand it. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to understand why I'm saying this, because in the Jewish culture, when you are five years old, you start learning the Torah. Hallelujah. And you start studying the prophets at five years old. Until you get to 12 years old, this is something you're supposed to know. You understand? And those kids that get to uh, uh, 12 years old and they do a good job at the, the training, they select them. They call them the Talmud. Okay? Not the Talmud. Talmud is a book. Talmud is a, a special student. And that student, they will take him and they will send him under the, the, the leadership of a rabbi. And these rabbis are supposed to teach him how to be like him. Amen? So this man is following the, the rabbi. So the rabbi go left, he go right, left. He's not just learning the knowledge of the rabbi, but he's learning to become like the rabbi. Okay? Then the people who did not make it to become the special student, they go and begin to follow the trade of their parents. So Jesus Christ was a carpenter. Because his father was a carpenter, a healthy father. Amen. Peter and all those guys, they become fishermen because their parents, that makes all of those guys did not make it to become a special student. Hallelujah. No wonder when Jesus called them, he said, follow me. They did not argue. They follow him because what a special opportunity to be considered a special student. And not a special student of who? Of Jesus who was doing miracles, who was doing amazing things was changing people's lives. They said, well, we're going to become just like him. And he told them, follow me, and I'll make you fish of men. Hallelujah. So when, I'm, when I'm, I'm looking at that, I'm like, God, why did they not get it? Hallelujah. And sometimes I read the Old Testament, and you will see Israel. Big miracle will happen. God will do miracle just to convince Pharaoh to let them go was miracle upon miracle. But right after the next miracle, these guys still complaining. They saw God destroy the entire army of Pharaoh on the ice. Nobody told them. They saw it. They passed, as we were talking about baptism last time. Hallelujah. In a dry ground, water separated in front of them. Hallelujah. They saw it. Okay? They saw the angel move from front and go on the back. And the other side become dark. And their side become light. God making a difference between Egypt and them. They saw it. Miriam made a song. They sing song. But as soon as they passed the other side, they did not have water. They started insulting God. God gave them water. They start complaining about food. He gave them food. They said, we're tired of this. Human being, forget quick. We want more, but we are not grateful for the other. Palm Sunday is about a reminder of the faithfulness of God. How can God give a destiny to a donkey? Many, many years before, 
It said there will be a donkey that will carry Jesus. Hundreds of years later, God is fulfilling a destiny of a donkey. Ask your neighbor, if God can fulfill a destiny of a donkey, what about you who carry his spirit? I don't know if you are hearing me this morning. If God can say something about a donkey, that this is what I will do about donkey. The donkey is born, doesn't even have no idea about that. What about you and me? So the first thing we see there in Matthew chapter 21, when you get a chance to read it, you will see the faithfulness of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is faithful. It's not the man who shall lie. Hallelujah. Even if it looks like it's not making sense, he's working. Hallelujah. What does not make sense today is what you would thank God for 10 years now. When your eye will open, you say, whoa, he makes sense now. Hallelujah. Palm Sunday is to demonstrate the fulfillment of, and the faithfulness of God. But Palm Sunday is also to demonstrate the humility. How a mighty God who can come in a horse accepted to sit on a donkey. Hallelujah. It's to remind us if me creator of the universe, I can, I can even make another uh, special type of uh, a, a, a horse right now, but I have decided to ride a donkey. You that are following me, humble yourself. Hallelujah. Palm Sunday not only is fulfilling the prophecy and reminding us about humility, but Palm Sunday should also remind us about how God set patterns in our life to give you an announcement of what will happen in the future. See, do not neglect the few things that God is doing in your life today. Amen. Hallelujah. Do not, you, you, you're doing a little business, you're doing this and that. Do not neglect what you call a little bit. Because those a little bit is indication that he can do a little bit much. Amen. That a little bit much is indication that he can do big. That, that can, God is always setting patterns in front of us to tell us that I'm going to come true. Hallelujah. If I can give you a job, amen, I can take care of the other one. Hallelujah. If I'm waking you up in the morning, that means I still have a great plan for you. Amen. So Jesus comes with a donkey, but we know there's a pattern set that is going to come back on a horse. Hallelujah. And he comes and he dealt with the temple, and whatever was happening there, that's a message that one day is going to return and is going to set things in order. Amen. I heard my sister, Lavette, I heard brother Fabrice, I'm telling you, as long as that we live in this world here, hallelujah, we are in the kingdom of injustice. But there is a day, the king of kings will come not like a lamb of God. Not anymore. It's going to come like a lion. Read Revelation chapter 5 verse 5. This time he will come like a lion. And when he comes, he will have a road. He will clean the house. Oh, I'm so glad because he started in the temple. He didn't go after the politician first. He started in the temple. See, sometimes we, 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 we look at what those politicians are doing and we go crazy. Then I ask myself a question. Most of those politicians, especially American politicians, they go to church. What are they being preached? They have pastors. When the pastor seeing their member acting like a fool, do they call them in the office? No. Pastor is just happy 
that a superstar politician is a member of his church. He brag about it. That's all. He can never, he's happy when they steal the million of dollars, they give him some of it, and he can build his church, and he can build his big house, drive a fancy car, and his mouth is closed. He cannot be like Nathan. And say, sir, that man is you. Repent. Hallelujah. See, if you are a servant of God and you lack character, you cannot bring a revolution. And the issue we are having in our countries, and even is happening right here, I'm telling you, it's not the politician first. It's the church. <laughs> it's the people of God. That's why Jesus came. Palm Sunday is reminding us, deal with them. The church people, deal with them. When you fix their brain, everything else will going to fall in place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me make my point here. Number one thing we saw, go back please in the, first, in the screen where you were before. Jesus sent two disciples. Hallelujah. The two disciples, if you read, he gave them a very clear vision. Amen. So to your neighbor, God is not an author of confusion. He told them exactly what to do. Amen. And he gave them a clear instruction where, what, what, what they have to do. But the problem is he anticipated a problem. He told them, he said, if they resist you. Hallelujah. See, clear vision, clear instruction is not enough. Because the enemy will not let you just flow and do your thing. He said, in case they resist you, this is what you're going to say. The master has the need of it. And I love the word master. Why did he not say the, ra the rabbi? Hallelujah. Why did he not just say Jesus? He said the master because he want them to understand that everything in this world here, I master it. Amen. I am in charge. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I am the commander in chief. I am the one who have the last word. So I'm using the word master to let you know that they cannot resist it. If you are, you are master, you need to know that they are master of masters. Hallelujah. He said, when you go there, just say that. What does he tell us? Palm Sunday is reminding us that without Jesus, your vision, your idea, your anything will not flourish because the devil will fight you. You yourself will fight you. People will fight you. You need to have Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ. No business of a child of God will flourish without you inviting Jesus. Because the day you are baptized, he say you are my beloved son. It means you become the enemy of the devil. You understand we talked about baptism last time. So he's there intentionally, strategically trying to crush everything you do. And you need to have Jesus. Amen? Amen. The donkey and cult. They were predestined. I just show you the verse. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. Amen. Predestined to carry Jesus. Jesus sent the disciples. They did a good job. They went and set the guy free. I mean the, the donkey free. Hallelujah. John and other guys, they talk about the story. They don't talk about the, 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 the two anymore. They only talk about donkey. Matthew is the only one that talk about donkey and cart, exactly as uh, the, text, the text said. I always wonder, why is it that the donkey was bound, the cart was there, because the Bible says she was, he was bound, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, and the cart was right beside her. Was, was he also bound? I don't really see the evidence, but I'll go read again. But what I'm thinking is like, but, but put that for me. 
put for Matthew chapter 21. I want to make sure that I'm not talking some rubbish here. God help me. Matthew chapter 21. Okay, read with me. Say, now when they, they drew near to Jerusalem and came to, uh huh, at the Mount Olive, then Jesus sent two disciples, next verse, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you and Immediately you will find a donkey tied, hold on, who's tied, and a cart with her. Is she tied with her, or is she just there? Huh? Lose them and bring them to me. Hallelujah. So she's also tied. Hallelujah. Now, my point here I wanted to make is that when you are into a destiny, God has a destiny for you. Your destiny can be connected with other people. Hallelujah. Your bandage can influence the bandage of other people. Amen. Imagine that, let's say God in his wisdom and in his plan, he planned that my brother here, he's the one who has to help me to go through school. But he's bound in sickness and can't even work. What happened to my school? You understand? So me, I'm bound with poverty. He's bound with sickness. But my destiny is connected to his destiny. So his freedom is my freedom. So not only they have to lose me, but they have to lose him. Because if he's lose, then I'm lose too. Hallelujah. That is why even in, this, in, in, the, in the life as a Christian in the church, you should stop that language that this is my life. Our life is interconnected. Palm Sunday should remind you that our life is interconnected. One day I was in the airport and somebody was complaining because they're telling us to take out our shoe and stuff and this. I was looking at this person. My heart was going boom, 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 boom. boom. I said, I have to say something. You know what I do? Sometimes I wear slippers and I wear uh, uh, jogging, Okay. Because I don't have to take out the belt. And I don't have to do that. So I said, you can do that. Why are you complaining? Something was telling me, you got to talk to him. I went to him. I said, sir, is he here? We don't know everybody. If they put a bomb in that plane, we all dead. I don't know about you, but me, I got a big plan in life. I'm not planning to die here. Leave these people alone to do their job. You understand? See, selfishness will occupy your mind and make you blind. Amen? So, even though they have all the things, God set the donkey free. I mean, the disciples went and set them free. They took the cloth and put on the donkey and everything. But this donkey was not valuable and the mission was not fulfilled until Jesus set on them. So without Jesus Christ, not only your instruction will not help you, but you can be delivered still failing. You can be a prayer warrior still failing. You need Jesus. That's why he told the disciple, I will not leave you often. I will come to you. And he said, I will send you the Holy Spirit who will come and live inside of you. Why? Without the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus in us, hope of glory, you can never achieve what God has destined you for. Don't be satisfied to just be a church goer. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's what makes a difference, Pastor. The Holy Spirit. When he's set in them, that's when they start walking. And that's when people start screaming and shouting. That's when the prophecy is fulfilled. Praise God for your degree. Praise God for your finance. Praise God for your business plan. Praise God for all the things you know. But if Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, does not come on you, you are just a useless instrument. Amen. Next one. 
What we see is the temple. Let's go to the temple. Go to the, the, the PowerPoint part. The temple was beautiful. Amen? It was crowded. A lot of activities. But missing something. People are coming from everywhere to come make sacrifice in that place. You know, you know as we are temple of the Holy Spirit, as Paul said, did you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that you don't belong to yourself? You know, you can be so busy with things of God, but you miss the point. Hallelujah. A church can be full of activity like, well, we're doing mission work. We're doing this. We're doing that. We're doing that. We're doing that. You know, you can so busy and it can be so crowded, but yet you make God mad every time I look at you. Because see, they were exchanging money over there. Of course, there were some crooks also. But the issue of them changing money was why? Because people were coming from different places, far away. They didn't have to carry the, the, dung, the, the, the cow from uh, Raleigh to come to Jerusalem. It's too far. So it's better to just come buy it by the temple. So that's not a problem. Hallelujah. Now, if you live in another place, you come to worship in Jerusalem, you had currency that is uh, Fran, Fran Francais or whatever, Francefa. Oh, Lord, help us, deliver us from Francefa. So you have Francefa and you brought it here at Jerusalem. What happened? You have to uh, exchange it, right? So tell me, were these people doing something wrong? No, they're facilitating people to come and worship. But why was God mad at them? Why was Jesus start beating people in the temple? He said it. He said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. And you have changed the purpose of it. Hallelujah. As your neighbor say, what, what's your purpose? It was in that place that Solomon prayed. He said, Lord. Hallelujah. He said, Lord. Whenever people will come here to call on your name, answer them. And the presence of God came and filled the place that even the priest and the high priest could not enter. In that same place, my brother. Years later, people are doing activities. It looks like a church. It looks like some move is happening there. But God was not there. The proof is that as soon as Jesus put everything in order, he healed the lamb. Hallelujah. He made the blind to see. Miracle begin to happen. Which means for miracle to happen, the atmosphere of miracle need to be set. And the atmosphere of miracle need to be set by the prayer. And prayer is not just talking to God as we are talking to him. But prayer is the relationship with God himself. When God is saying that, I, I, want, you, I want you to pray without ceasing. How do you do that? It's through your relationship with God. Have you ever, I don't know, Pastor, or, no, you will say they are pastors. Let me just ask anybody here. Have you ever been in some place where you are feeling so much the presence of God, but you don't know, you, you didn't pray hard, but you're just feeling that it's like electricity in your body or something, and, and you're just feeling something is happening to you. Have, you. have you, it happened to you before? And you're like, what's happening? Because you're in a communion with the Father. Hallelujah. You're walking your faith with trembling. You're walking a life of righteousness. Amen. And God is flowing to his power in your life. That itself is prayer. That's why you see some people can pray for five hours and nothing happen. Amen. Then you see somebody pray for two minutes, something happened. 
because this person has a relationship with God. Hallelujah. Imagine you're walking on the road and somebody calls your name, Obed. You look, you don't know that person. What happened? You keep going. But if you know the person, what happened? You stop and you talk with them. Amen. If he knows you, that's your name, does he know you? If he knows you, he's going to stop. Are you not glad that he knows all of us? Hallelujah. That he's going to stop for us? So we're learning a lesson here that the beauty of our building, the Nation building looks beautiful. Look at all these flags and nice. And we have nice people here. The beauty of all this is not enough. The crowd is not enough. Unfortunately, we think because there is crowd, God is there. While we read in the Bible, it said, narrow is the way that gives to bring to life. Wide is the way that brings to prediction. What was he telling us? That some of the crowd, they're all going to hell. <laughs> you understand? Now that we, we don't desire a crowd, we, we want a crowd, but crowd of people who are repentant, crowd of people who understand the things of God, quality crowd. Amen. But even that, if you miss the purpose of Christ reigning in your life, the house of his father. Amen. You do nothing. Religious leaders, they study the word. They had knowledge, but guess what? Their selfish ambition blinded them to catch the revelation of the Messiah from verse 15 to 17. These are people that all the years they've been waiting for the Messiah. But the Messiah was right there, but they cannot see. Why? They become blind because of their selfish ambition. Hallelujah. If this guy will leave him alone to continue to progress, what happened to us? We are out of business. But if this guy is a Messiah, you don't even need that business anymore because all of us are going to prosper. Hallelujah. Check your motive. Everything that you want to do. Fig tree. What do we have in the fig tree there? Fig tree, why do they... they, they before even I go to fig tree, let me talk to you about the crowd again. The Bible said that some of the people in the crowd, which means that some others did not do what? Did not join in singing Hosanna. Hallelujah. God was speaking to me through that. that. Listen, it doesn't matter how good you are, there will always be people who will not accept you. Learn it Get used to it. Live with it. Amen. Can you say that to your neighbor? It doesn't matter who you are. How nice you are. In the crowd, there will still be some people. They don't like you. There's nothing you can do. They sat there and they did not care. Amen. About what was happening. But majority were singing Hosanna to him. The Bible said they took the leaves, right? I went and researched that. What was happening, the meaning of the leaves in that time of Jesus? I have so many books that I can check stuff like that. And I was checking that. They said the leaves, that, that particular branches that they were using, symbolize triumph. Hallelujah. It symbolized victory. And it symbolized eternal life. I was amazed. Wow. These people, these pagans, they knew about eternal life. That means they were also longing for those kind of things. Okay? And it meant peace. So I said, Holy Spirit, speak to me. What's happening here? So what I was getting is that by them taking their clothes and putting on the ground for Jesus, 
and the donkey to walk on it. Hallelujah. And let me put a little bracket here. You will notice that Jesus is not actually the one walking on the cloth. It's the donkey. Hallelujah. That means that you can also participate in the glory of God. Please, but remember, the glory of God doesn't belong to you. The cloth they did not put for you. You see, pastor, when God begins to elevate you, don't forget, the cloth was not put for you. It was put for Jesus. You just happen to participate. So stay humble. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see that? So as they're passing there, they put the cloth down. Your cloth can represent protection, your protection. Because if you don't have cloth, you have no protection. You are shame, you expose. Amen? Your cloth can represent your glory. Because if you dress well and go, everybody's looking, wow, that's nice. And this can represent your glory. Your cloth can represent your ministry because he told them to be clothed. Amen? Your cloth can represent a lot of things. By you, by taking it and putting it on the ground, it means that you are saying, I'm nothing without you. You should walk on my ministry. You should walk on my glory. You should walk. That's why the book of Revelation is saying that they took the crown and they cast it front, in front of him. The crown was given to them because of what they did. But they say even if we did it, we did it because of you. So take it back. Oh, I have accomplished this. I did it because of you. Take it back. So they took the glory and everything they had and lay it on the floor. Some of us still wearing our clothes. We can't let go of our achievement. Paul said, whatever I've accomplished, I look at it as nothing. I'm pressing for something more important. This Palm Sunday, think about that. There's something important. Him and him crucified. The relationship with him. Because the day you die, your mansion will not go with you. Your degree will not go with you. We're just going to write it in your tomb. Mr. So-and-so was this, that's it. There's something more important. They took their peace and traded it for his peace. Because our peace is temporary. But he said, I give you my peace. Not like the world will give to you. Because his peace is a seal. It's a, through the Holy Ghost. He stays with us. The Prince of Peace, they said, take our peace and give us yours. They took their victory and their triumph. They put it down because they said, your victory is permanent. Your protection is permanent. Your blessing is permanent. But see, even when they did that, they still was missing one thing. Because in verse 11, when they asked them, who is this guy? They say he's a prophet. They did not realize. So why? Because revelation come by the Holy Spirit. What do I mean? One week after the same crowd, they say crucify him. They gave them the words of the criminal Barnabas. Barabbas. I said Barnabas. Barabbas. And they gave them Jesus. They said pick one. Majority, the same crowd, majority said, you see, if you don't have a revelation of Jesus, my sister, on your own, you are not grounded in the things of God. Hmm? When the wind will blow, because the wind will blow for everybody. Amen. When challenge will come, you know what's going to happen to you? You are going to reject God. We're singing songs in the church. We're shouting. We're praising God. But the question is that if it gets complicated, can you still Stand and glorify him or you reject him. Amen. So let me come on the fig tree. If, if, if you read it, you are not careful. You will not understand that those things are interchangeable. They are, I mean, they are interconnected. Because the author, Matthew, is writing it. He's not putting verse 17 there before 15 for no reason. There's a reason. Amen. So when... when, when, when 
When this guy come there and said, I want to eat from the fruit. I mean from the tree. The fruit is not there. He cursed it. What is he saying? He said, you see these religious leaders? Knowledge, but no fruit. And they are good for nothing. Amen. Don't be a Christian who knows so much, but no fruit. Hallelujah. Before you add more knowledge, can you use what you have? Uh oh. What are you doing with what you already have? You want more? Hallelujah. So God is calling us to be productive. Amen. And the reason why religious leaders, they were that way. The reason why today we are the way we are because we lack revelation. And the revelation comes by the Holy Spirit being in you. Amen. Go to the next screen, please. How do you get the revelation? I said through the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, 26, he said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father sent in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I say to you. Beloved, you will fail if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Amen? Without the Holy Spirit, I say in my note, we cannot understand the mystery of the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. And if you don't understand that, you are not a Christian. Why did Jesus say in 14, verse 18, if you read actually verse 1, he said, do not let your heart be troubled. Amen? Believe in God and believe in me. You know why we are always troubled? I don't know about you, I'm sometimes troubled. Have you been troubled before? Sometimes when it gets complicated, I'm troubled, pastor. I'm confused. I'm like, God, where are you? But he said, don't be troubled. But he told them, he said, I'm preparing a place for you, but they were still not satisfied. Then that's when in verse 18, he said, I'm coming to you. And they cool down a little bit. He's coming back. But how do I'm coming to you? I'm coming to you through the Holy Spirit. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in you is also the presence of Jesus. That will lead me to the next screen. Where... We ask, move from this, we have already read that last time, where we ask the question, at what point somebody receive the Holy Spirit? Before I answer that question quickly, I want you to turn to your neighbor, ask the question, please, between you and me, do you have the Holy Spirit? Just whisper in my ear, do you? <laughs> do you have him? Hmm? I love uh, pastor, one pastor from Congo, Mwanza or Mwanza. He used to ask a question in French. He said, Est-ce que tu as le Saint-Esprit ou tu as le Saint ainsi? You know? Do you have the Holy Spirit? I don't know how to translate that. It won't work in English. But basically what he's trying to say, do you really have him? Because if you have him, he has to show. Amen. Read with me Ephesians chapter 1, 13 to 14. I'm going to help you out. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 to 14. See something very important. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. Thank you. Thank you. Please read this one with me. The Bible says, well, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promises. When were you sealed with the Holy Spirit of promises? When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you have believed. So the day you heard the gospel, the day you, you, you believe in that gospel, that's the day the Holy Spirit enter into you. 
So touch your neighbor again. Ask them, are you saved? Did you give your life to Jesus? If you did, you got the Holy Spirit. Shout hallelujah, say I got the Holy Spirit. Don't let nobody fool you and begin to make you think like there's some crazy mystery, like the moon and the sun need to mix together and enter you, then you have the Holy Spirit. No, the day you believe, because the presence of Jesus Christ in you is the presence of the Father. Is the presence of the Holy Spirit. They are one. The Bible says in Revelation chapter uh, 3 verse 20. It says I'm knocking at the door. If you hear my voice, you open. Guess what? I'm coming in. Did you open? Yes. Then he come in. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Say it boldly. I do. Can you say I do? <laughs> Amen. But there's another question. That the Holy Spirit have you. Uh-uh. You have the Holy Spirit, but does the Holy Spirit have you? If He has you, which part of you you still own? Mm, you don't like that. Which part of you that you are having a hard time to let go? Hallelujah. I had so many parts, I still have some part. I had so many parts that I had a hard time to let go. One of them was worldly music. Oh, Lord. I love, I'm not going to make his publicity, but that man was good. <laughs> it was tough. I was preaching, but I still listened to it. I was struggling with that. It was like difficult for me. And some other area of my life was just hard for me. Amen. I'm just being honest here. You are like fake preachers. People who act like I'm all that. I'm telling you I struggle big time in some area of my life. I had to surrender those area to God and tell the Holy Spirit, I know you are already in me, but can you take this also? Amen? Can you also take this part? Maybe that should be your prayer on this Palm Sunday. That area that you are still failing, can you surrender that area to him? Amen. That is when we have now the need of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what happened? You are immersed in him. Now you don't have him, he has you. You see, when we're putting you in the water, if we let go of you, you fall. Because the water has control of you. You are now deeper in the ocean of the unknowing thing of the Holy Ghost. You are not leading. See, there is, there, is, there is pool and pool. When you are swimming, okay, why do they put edges or, or size in the, in the swimming pool? They will say until here, this edge or this size, until here. You don't see that in swimming pool? Because there is a level of maturity that you got to get into for you to go deeper. Hallelujah. And your maturity is not just in your competence. It's in your ability to understand the word of God and apply it. So the more you are applying the word, the deeper you are going with Christ. Hallelujah. And when you go deeper, that's when you're going to get to a point where you lose control. Now, that's, that's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is the baptism of fire where it takes control of you. Amen. So it moves you from justification where your sin is forgiven to adoption. Amen. You're a child of God. Then it moves you from adoption to what? Regeneration. When it begins to transform your mind. Because if your mind does not transform, your, 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 your lifestyle will not transform. You understand? Your mind, as men think so he is, we do things that we think first. Then we do them. So then when you move from there, where do you go? You go to sanctification. And sanctification will grow. You have to grow. I will continue this teaching. And I will show you in the Bible, how can you grow in your sanctification? Amen. Hallelujah. It's not the work you're doing. It's the availability you are giving. You are being available and the Holy Spirit is doing the work in you. You don't produce fruit. The, 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 the Holy Spirit produces fruit in you. You, what you have to do is let go. Let go and let him 
move. And that's the most difficult thing. I know because I struggled in many areas of my life in the past. I'm just, I just, I, I like guy, I'm a, a guy that I like to control. I like to, to have control of things. I, I, I don't like to let go easily. But God has to teach me to let go. If I want to work with him, I got to let go. So this Palm Sunday, I'm going to continue this next time. This Palm Sunday, I just want to remind all of us that it doesn't matter what you, who you are, I mean, who you are, what you have accomplished in your life, what you have. If you don't have Jesus in you, which is in you now through the Holy Spirit, my friend, you will not achieve anything. You will practice religion, but without revelation. You will love him today. You will reject it when it becomes painful. Amen. Am I saying something to somebody today? I don't know what I said to you. I have like a minute to finish. I would like for you to stand. Maybe you are here. But you never surrender your life to Jesus Christ that he can come upon you. I would like to give you an opportunity. Every eye is closed. Thank you.